Hello everyone and welcome to this video on fundamentals of contract law. Uh, what we're going to be doing is looking at what the definition of a contract is, uh, what different forms a contract can take, um, and then finally what the essential features of a contract are, i.e. what needs to be in place and what needs to be true in order for a contract to be valid and legally enforceable. So if we start with just the simple question of what a contract is exactly, uh, well, a contract is an agreement between two or more parties, uh, which is freely entered into. So there has to be genuine consent uh, and the parties involved have to have the capacity to actually enter into that contract. Um, there has to be an actual intention for that contract uh, and the conditions of that contract to be enforced by a legal third party. Uh, if we're talking about contracts within the UK governed by uh, English common law, uh, that's typically uh, the UK legal system and UK courts. Uh, and these next two bits are, are really at the heart of what a contract needs to do. Uh, it creates the cre uh, sorry it creates a network of obligations uh, between the parties involved. So the, each party should have some sort of benefit from the contract. Uh, as well as some sort of obligation or responsibility. Um, this enables a transfer, uh, the transfer of consideration from uh, the different parties to each other. Uh, this consideration has to be sufficient, so it has to be something of value that's being transferred, uh, although courts are not inclined to judge whether that's uh, adequate or not, uh, but there has to be some sort of consideration from one to another. Uh, and lastly, the object of the contract itself must be legal. Uh, so if you wish to sign a contract in order to sell or buy some cocaine or heroin, um, that contract, even if everything else is present, is not going to be legally enforceable uh, because the object itself is not legal. So we're looking at an agreement uh, in order to exchange or transfer things of value between different parties. Uh, now, consideration, the, the thing of value, uh, doesn't have to be something physical or material. Um, it can be money. Uh, it can be non-tangible. Uh, so something like intellectual property, for example, can be transferred as consideration. Uh, it can be a promise to do something or a promise not to do something. Uh, it can be a, a, a forbearance of rights, giving up some of your uh, your legal rights that you have. Uh, so there's a, a huge range of things that consideration can be, uh, but every contract must have some form of consideration. The purpose of a contract ultimately is to actually uh, transfer consideration from, uh, from parties uh, involved in the contract. So now let's move on to looking at the different forms a contract can take. Um, now, this is very much... Uh, Within English common law, you will find in, in different jurisdictions and different countries, uh, there may well, and they are different forms uh, a contract uh, is able to take. Uh, but within the UK, anyway, we have quite a range. Um, so the first is, is not immediately obvious, uh, but action contracts are valid and legally binding under English common law. Uh, so this is a contract where they may not be a verbal or written agreement, uh, but there is uh, an action taken which signifies in ideally a clear and unequivocal manner uh, the intention to offer and then accept an agreement for something. Um, so a, a really good and common example of this is a vending machine. Uh, so there is no verbal or written contract uh, contact between the uh, vending machine company um, and the consumer, uh, but yet the offer is quite clearly made through the display of goods, the display, and, and usually some form of text on the vending machine as well. Uh, and then the consumer takes unequivocal, clear, positive action, which signifies the acceptance of that offer. Uh, so therefore, that is a legally binding contract which arises. Um, this is often called uh, acceptance by affirmative action, uh, so it, it does actually require something clear. What you cannot do uh, is simply state that, uh, you know, for example, if you wish to enter into a contract with me uh, to purchase my phone, uh, please stay seated or, or remain in the position you're in for the next 10 seconds. 
um, that wouldn't be an action contract because that isn't clear and, uh, and unequivocal. Um, there has to be some sort of proactive clear action that's taken, uh, which makes it very obvious uh, that there is intention to enter into a particular contract. Um, however, action contracts are real, they are legally binding and they can be enforced. The next form of a, a, a legally binding contract would be a verbal contract. Um, now, these are legal and, and they can and, and sometimes often are enforced, uh, but they aren't really a good idea for many things um, for obvious reasons. So unless a verbal contract is uh, recorded using electronic means uh, or notes are taken and agreed upon uh, or their third party witnesses present, uh, it can be very difficult to actually establish the terms and conditions of a verbal contract. Um, it can be very easy for various disaffected parties to claim that the contract didn't exist or the terms of the contract are actually different from what the other party says, uh, and things can become uh, very messy quite quickly. Um, it is common for ad hoc procurement to use verbal contracts. It can be very common uh, for um, for trusted suppliers and long-term relationships to work to a degree on verbal contracts with the understanding that things will be drawn up and written afterwards. Um, that's often problematic. Uh, firstly, because consideration should be fresh consideration at the time the contract is formally agreed. Um, so the contract actually is formally from when there is a verbal agreement, not from when it was written down later. Uh, and also because any disputes can then become very difficult to unpick uh, and uh, and resolve. Um, however, despite this, because it's convenient, easy and quick, uh, it still sees a fair bit of use, uh, although uh, well-ordered and organised procurement processes will avoid verbal contracts and verbal agreements wherever possible. Um, there are some interesting examples as well of where people have essentially acknowledged that a verbal agreement has taken place or a conversation did take place uh, and then the contract was enforced upon them uh, in sometimes surprising circumstances. Um, the incident that does come to mind is actually with Whoopi Goldberg who starred in a really awful film, I, I really don't recommend that you watch it, called T-Rex. Um, she agreed verbally uh, in a conversation with a producer to star in this film, which involves a buddy dynamic between a policewoman and a T-Rex. Um, however, in the interim, uh, she starred in, I think, Sister Act, became a massive star and, and came to her senses and decided not to appear in this film. Unfortunately, because Whoopi Goldberg did uh, acknowledge uh, that this conversation did take place and there was a tentative agreement. Uh, she was actually sued for, I think, eight or nine million dollars um, and decided to carry out the contract to avoid having to pay damages. Uh, so there are instances where people do acknowledge a conversation has taken place uh, and that itself uh, can lead to the enforcement of verbal contracts. And as I said before as well, remember the principle that has been established with action contracts uh, where if there's evidence through uh, active action, um, that too can lend credence to claims of a verbal agreement. Uh, most contracts, however, are going to be written contracts, um, and this is pretty much what you would expect, uh, a contract where the, an agreement where the terms and conditions and the details are clearly written down, uh, and there's uh, evidence of assent or agreement by all of the parties involved. Um, this, for obvious reasons, is the preferred method uh, for any kind of contract in, well, to be honest, both business and personal spheres. It provides a clear uh, frame of reference, a point of reference. It allows all the parties, as well as uh, outside third parties and legal authorities, uh, such as courts and judges, to go back and, and scrutinise uh, the actual original agreement, the actual contract itself, um, and will aid in dispute resolution if the contract is relatively comprehensive and clearly written and defined. Um, there is a subset of written contracts, however, called speciality contracts, uh, which provide uh, even greater assurances and e even greater uh, clarity. 
Uh, so specialty contracts uh, often used for things like real estate transactions uh, will be written, uh, but they are additionally signed and witnessed. Uh, the phrase signed, sealed and delivered uh, dates back from uh, uh, when I think in the UK this changed in about the 80s or, or the early 90s. Uh, where specialty contracts used to uh, be sealed as well to, to have a, an actual seal affixed to it. Um, that's no longer necessary, uh, but signing and witnessing uh, these uh, specialty contracts is still a requirement. So they, there needs to be external third party uh, witnesses uh, to the contract. There must be a, a signature from all of the parties involved. Uh, and often uh, copies of the specialty contract will also be kept with third parties. So typically law firms that have been involved in drawing up the contract to ensure that there's no tampering or, or undue changes, unilateral changes by a single party. Uh, so for things like real estate transactions, this provides uh, a greater assurance that the contract does capture the original agreement and there is clear consent and agreement. Uh, so that takes us through the different forms of contracts. Uh, what we're going to do now is move on to looking at what the essential features of a contract are. Uh, so we have eight distinct features here, all of which must be present uh, um, uh, during an agreement uh, in order to make it a legally binding and legally enforceable contract. And we're just going to run through all of these one by one. Uh, so the first would be intention. So what we cannot do is try and trick somebody into a contract or a legal agreement. Uh, that's not going to be enforceable. Uh, there has to be real intention uh, by all parties to enter into the agreement. Uh, now, the law doesn't protect you against uh, poor bargaining or uh, poor negotiation. Uh, so your intention as to the outcome of the contract is irrelevant. Uh, so you could enter into an agreement with a supplier and your intention is uh, to gain goods at remarkably cheap rates and then drop the supplier immediately afterwards or, or whatever business plan that you have. Um, and the contract may end up being long lasting, particularly high cost and not very profitable and even drag you into a loss. Um, that's utterly irrelevant as far as the contract is concerned. Uh, what is clear that you had the intention to enter into a uh, an agreement with the supplier uh, to purchase certain goods and so on. Uh, that's the only thing which matters. Uh, so when we talk about intention being a necessary essential feature of a contract, um, the overall goal of the contract, the long term plan, how it fits into other uh, uh, other aspects of the business or, or your personal life uh, are not really of any concern. Uh, the only concern is, uh, did you intend to enter into a relationship with that party? Did you intend to enter into an agreement with that party? Uh, if the answer is yes, uh, then there is intention there to enter into a contract. Uh, what can't be uh, legally enforced uh, is where one party had no intention and no awareness that they were entering into a uh, an agreement. Um, that's not the case. Um, whether the awareness is that this is a formal contract, again, is irrelevant. It's whether it's a relationship uh, or, or an actual uh, engagement. So uh, you may not be aware that you're entering into a legal contract when you purchase uh, something from a vending machine, uh, but you clearly intend to hand over some money uh, and receive a packet of crisps or a drink or, or a chocolate bar. Uh, so there is still clear intention there. Uh, the next uh, essential feature would be uh, an offer. Uh, so every legal agreement, every contract must have some sort of offer, uh, which obviously has to be accepted for the contract to be in force. Um, but some sort of offer must be present somewhere uh, uh, during the negotiations uh, or the lead up to, to the actual agreement between the parties. Um, it's worth taking a few moments here just to distinguish between a few things uh, that are often seen as offers but are not. Uh, and the major one here would be invitations to treat. Uh, so an invitation to treat is really the opening part of a negotiation. Um, it can be the encouragement of the other party to come to the table and to discuss uh, or negotiate certain features of the contract. Uh, but it is not legally binding. It doesn't actually constitute an offer. 
Uh, so if you were to walk into a physical store and see a price tag or a sticker on an item, uh, that's an invitation to treat. It is not a legal offer. Uh, which means if you were to go into a store and see something you particularly like and it's uh, at a remarkably uh, cheap price, uh, so the sticker or the price tag is, say, £20, uh, you take it to the checkout and the uh, employee at the checkout says, oh, actually, this has been mislabeled, uh, it's actually on sale for £200, um, that's not a legal offer, so therefore you cannot insist that the store honour uh, the price tag or the sticker. Uh, now, often stores will do so uh, to retain customer goodwill. Uh, the difference in price is often quite marginal and retaining customer uh, consumer goodwill is, is more important. But there's no legal obligation for them to do so. The price tag or sticker is just an invitation to treat. Uh, the offer comes uh, when at the checkout the item is scanned uh, and there's a request for, uh, say, you know, in this case, £20. Um, so if the uh, offer had been made um, at the checkout, uh, the mistake hadn't been picked up, uh, you were asked to pay £20, uh, then the offer is made, and then if you accept that offer, hand over the £20, the contract has been, uh, has been finished. Uh, in the same vein, when we look at quotations, they are invitations to treat, they are not legally binding. Uh, again, in many cases, companies will choose to honour quotations even if a mistake has been made on their part. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, a, a business decision, not a legal decision. Uh, legally, they're quite free to uh, turn down uh, the, the quotation they had made and, and actually give a fresh quotation or to quote a different price. Uh, so quotations are invitations to treat. They are not legal offers. However, tenders are legal offers. So if you're part of a procurement process uh, uh, and there's a request for tenders and you submit a tender to a procuring organization, uh, that tender is seen to be a legal offer. Uh, and if the procurer then accepts your tender, uh, that contract is now in force and a, a, an agreement has been reached. Uh, so tenders are not invitations to treat. Tenders are legal offers. Uh, that's why tenders have to be carefully uh, examined, uh, carefully crafted uh, and approved before they actually go into the procuring organisation. Uh, two other elements of uh, offers which is worth highlighting. Uh, firstly, offers can expire. So if you explicitly state uh, that uh, you're willing to sell uh, an item for a certain price with certain uh, terms and conditions, uh, however, this offer expires in 30 days or ex expires in a particular date or a particular time, um, then uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, fine. And then the offer does expire. So any acceptance of the offer after the expiry, uh, uh, expiry date, the expiry time uh, would not mark a legal agreement, would not mark the start of a contract. Uh, offers can also be revoked. Uh, so if you were to uh, to issue an offer uh, and then unilaterally revoke that offer, as long as the revocation occurs before the acceptance, um, that also would invalidate any agreement, invalidate any contract. Uh, so whoever accepts an offer after it has been revoked uh, cannot enforce that agreement uh, because that is not a legally binding agreement. Uh, now we move on to consideration. So we've also uh, previously mentioned that consideration is something of value uh, that's being exchanged. Uh, it's really the, the core part of what the agreement in a contract pertains to. Uh, so consideration must be real. Um, this doesn't mean that it has to be of a particular type, but simply that there must be actual value attached. Uh, a, you know, a, a consideration which has no identifiable or arguable value at all. Uh, it is not good consideration, uh, but this value can take many, many forms. Uh, so as we said before, it can be something physical, a good or material uh, that's being exchanged. It can be money. Uh, it can be a promise to do something, a promise not to do something. Uh, it can be forbearance of rights, so giving up some of your legal rights. Uh, so if you have uh, property, for example, uh, and you have the right to, to keep people off your property, you know, by, by forbearing your rights with the, the use of uh, your, your land in some way uh, can be consideration as well. 
Uh, now, consideration must be sufficient. So in this case, it, it has to have real value and it has to uh, be uh, be valid consideration in terms of uh, the means uh, uh, that it takes, but it doesn't need to be adequate. Uh, so there is no uh, possibility or, or there's no desire on the part of, uh, of the courts and judges uh, to actually judge what is and isn't uh, adequate consideration. Uh, so the only test here is that there is sufficient consideration, there is something of value. So if you enter into a contract uh, to sell your house, you know, worth uh, 250 or 200,000 uh, pounds for the value of 50p or, or two pounds 50, uh, that is still legally binding, it is still legally valid. So there's no need for adequate consideration uh, but there must be some consideration. There must be sufficient consideration. Something of value uh, needs to be exchanged. And the other thing to, to remember or, or to bear in mind as well, uh, that good consideration should be fresh, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, having a contract where one party's obligations have already been discharged in the past uh, is not good consideration. Uh, so it should be fresh consideration that the agreement actually occurs prior to the transfer rather than uh, a, a significant period of time after the transfer. Uh, but ultimately, the thing to bear in mind is that uh, the law does not protect you against making a poor deal. Uh, so there is no judgment on, on uh, uh, when it comes to looking at whether a contract is legally enforceable uh, as to the commercial uh, aspects, uh, simply uh, sufficient rather than adequate consideration is required. Uh, the next essential feature, once you, you have an offer and you have consideration, would be acceptance. Uh, so there is a need for uh, unqualified acceptance, which would then complete the, the agreement and then the agreement is in place. Uh, it does require word or, or, or deeds uh, to do this. So remember back to action contracts, uh, we need something that's clearly affirmative, uh, uh, clearly proactive and uh, unambiguous. Um, but that, that, that itself, once done, uh, marks the, the end of the negotiation and the, the start of the agreement itself. Uh, it must be unqualified. So if you have qualified acceptance, so if, for example, one party says, I will sell you this mug, for uh, uh, 50 pence and the other party says uh, well I'll accept if you make it 40 pence uh, that's qualified acceptance uh, there is a qualifier there which changes some part of the contract so in this case changes the price uh, a qualified acceptance actually is uh, treated as a new offer and requires then uh, unqualified acceptance by the uh, by the other party before uh, the agreement is reached. So every time you qualify your acceptance saying yes, but um, then that actually marks a new offer uh, and you cannot roll back to the previous offer uh, without uh, it being expressly agreed. Uh, so for example, if I was to say I'll, I'll sell you a mug uh, for let's say one pound um, and the response is, well, I'll agree if you make that 50p uh, and then I, I reject that and say 70p, uh, we cannot roll back to previous offers. Uh, each new offer marks a, a new phase. And then if you wish to go back to a previous offer that was made to you, um, that can only be done with express permission, with the, with the express agreement of the party. So new offers then revoke the previous offer. The previous offer is no longer on the table and therefore cannot be accepted. Uh, we can move on to, uh, well, a, a similar feature or, or another aspect of this uh, is mutual agreement uh, that the offer and acceptance uh, then obviously marks uh, um, the, the start of the contract, uh, but it should have mutual agreement. It sh cannot be partial agreement. Uh, so even if we agree on uh, the mug itself and the price of the mug, uh, but one of the uh, terms of the contract is uh, when the uh, exchange will happen. Uh, so I'm happy to sell the mug to you for 50p, but I want to uh, hand over the mug uh, next week and, and you require the mug the next day. Um, that doesn't actually form a, a, a full uh, mutual agreement because there's disagreement on key terms. Uh, therefore, that's partial agreement and does not mark the start of a contract.
Uh, so there has to be uh, a, 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 a mutual complete agreement on everything that has been discussed. Uh, now, not all terms and conditions may be discussed, so there may be things that be missed out. Uh, and if that's the case, then there is a legally binding agreement in place. Um, but obviously, we have a dispute because there's uh, uh, particular aspects that were not considered and not discussed or brought up uh, during the initial negotiation. Um, that can become quite tricky, and which then increases uh, the need for procurement processes uh, to really be as comprehensive as possible uh, to pinpoint how the, the, the contract is to be executed uh, and all relevant details. So it's really important to have a clear statement of work that really lays all of this out. Um, but the thing to remember here, if there is a disagreement, so if something is discussed uh, and there isn't clear agreement on those terms or conditions, then that's a partial agreement rather than full mutual agreement. The next thing we're going to consider is capacity. Uh, so whether the parties actually have capacity to enter into the agreement in the first place. Uh, now, part of this is going to be legal capacity. So is the person of, uh, of sound mind, of legal age and so on. Uh, so do they actually have the ability to enter into legal agreements full stop? Uh, and that will differ from uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but generally is relatively clear. Uh, so in the UK, uh, you know, age and, and, and of sound mind are, are the key uh, qualifiers of capacity. Uh, but for business contracts, we also have the question of uh, having capacity to enter into the agreement in terms of authority. Uh, so if you have uh, one, uh, one or more parties involved in, in an agreement, um, being a, a corporation or an association or a business of some kind, uh, well, businesses and, and corporations and collective entities uh, aren't actually real. They are imagined for the most part. They have, uh, they have legal reality, but they are legal fictions. Uh, you can't point to something tangible and, and say this is, uh, say, Microsoft or, or, or this is um, Topshop for some reason comes to my mind, although I'm not entirely sure if Topshop is still... Um, you were, whether it still exists, uh, but the, you know some individual is actually uh, signing contracts and entering into agreements uh, on behalf of the uh, imagined collective entity. Uh, so this does raise the question of whether that person has the capacity to enter into the contract um, under the, the you know under their authority on behalf of the organization. Uh, and we have three types of authority. Uh, which can be present. So the first is relatively straightforward, and that's simply express authority. Uh, that's where the contract actually specifies that uh, so-and-so who holds this particular position uh, is entering into the agreement on behalf of this particular corporation or, uh, or, or collective. Uh, so express authority can actually be built into the written contract itself uh, and makes it very clear. Uh, implied authority uh, is where um, the individual does have uh, uh, the ability to enter into the contracts uh, within their organization and, and this is made clear by their position. Uh, um, so someone, so for example, if you're negotiating with the head of procurement uh, or a procurement officer or a head of department or a, a, you know, a board a, a director or a board member or a CEO, uh, it's fairly clear that they do have the authority to enter into uh, a, a, an agreement or a contract. Uh, so you're absolutely fine to go ahead on implied authority in those cases. The third uh, type of authority is a bit trickier, and this is apparent authority. Uh, and this is authority uh, which can be gleaned from the fact that the organization involved uh, acts as if the individual does have the authority to enter into contracts on their behalf. Uh, so if we take a particular employee um, that enters into a contract with a supplier, uh, the organization cannot turn around later and say, actually, this uh, uh, employee was not authorized uh, and does not have the ability to enter into a contract. Uh, and therefore, this contract is not valid uh, uh, and is null and void. 
Um, this will only be the case uh, if the uh, organization takes immediate action as soon as uh, uh, that contract comes to their attention. Uh, if they are aware of the contract, they're aware of the employee having entered into an agreement uh, and they either take uh, active action to facilitate that agreement or they passively uh, uh, allow the, the, the agreement to stand without immediately immediately taking action to, to draw it to a close, uh, then they've granted apparent authority to that individual. Uh, so organizations cannot use uh, the excuse that uh, a rogue employee has entered into contracts without their permission or, or without, uh, without authority um, unless they actually behave as if that's the case. This prevents uh, organizations uh, from trying to invalidate contracts uh, on the basis uh, that a rogue employee is, is acting uh, without instruction or against instruction. So we have express, implied and apparent authority, uh, uh, which covers the, the capacity of the parties to the contract, particularly those actually agreeing to the contract itself. Um, the next item we have here is uh, of legal substance, and this is relatively straightforward. Um, as we said before, a, a contract must actually have a legal objective. Uh, so a contract uh, to do something illegal or, or something which is not legal uh, is not a legally binding contract, is not a valid agreement. Uh, so there must be legal substance for the contract. It cannot be uh, uh, have illegal substance, uh, either the objective being illegal or some specified term or condition uh, which which is necessary for the execution of the contract uh, is illegal either of those things will uh, will render the contract uh, not enforceable uh, and not valid and our uh, last essential feature of the contract is genuine consent so that there must be genuine consent involved on all parties uh, and there are a few things uh, that can call into question whether there is genuine consent. Uh, so the first would be misrepresentation. Uh, so misrepresentation or re a representation uh, is a statement made uh, about some relevant aspect of the agreement or something connected to the agreement. Uh, so if I'm selling you uh, the mug, sorry, I have a mug in front of me as I'm recording this, which is why all of my uh, examples seem to be about mugs. Uh, but if I uh, say that this mug is is uh, is of an excellent quality, um, that is not a representation. That's an opinion. Uh, but if something, if I was to say that this mug uh, is made of ceramic, uh, then that's not an opinion. That is a representation. I'm making a claim uh, about the uh, the product, uh, which is uh, part of the contract or which the contract is there to sell. Uh, so if you make a representation. Uh, and you know that that representation uh, is uh, is not true. Uh, so if I was to sell you a plastic mug uh, and say to you quite clearly that this mug is made from ceramic, uh, then that is a misrepresentation. Uh, misrepresentation can also be uh, negligence. Uh, it can be, you know, uh, I genuinely believe that this mug is ceramic uh, because I don't know the difference between ceramic and plastic for some reason. Uh, but that is still misrepresentation. Now, silence is not misrepresentation uh, unless you're dealing with something where there's a legal duty to disclose. Uh, so if you ask me if the mug is ceramic or plastic and I remain silent, there has been no misrepresentation. Um, if I uh, simply move the topic on or change the topic or start talking about the wonderful colours that the mug is painted in, uh, again, no misrepresentation has occurred. Uh, so for uh, misrepresentation to call into question, um, you know, the genuine consent of the parties entering into the agreement, um, there has to be active statements made, uh, silence or slipping the question or changing the topic uh, do not amount to misrepresentation. Uh, as I said before, there are some fields uh, or, or some areas where there is a legal duty to disclose. Uh, so if you're selling pharmaceutical equipment, for example, or pharmaceutical materials, uh, I believe there is a legal duty to disclose. So if you know that there are safety concerns uh, or there are areas uh, where there is a, a legal obligation on you to report them, 
uh, to the uh, the potential purchasers uh, or the buyers. Uh, then uh, in that case, being silent, not mentioning or not answering questions about those safety concerns uh, will still be misrepresentation. Uh, so in those particular areas, uh, silence uh, and omission can still amount to misrepresentation uh, because you have a legal duty to disclose something. Um, right, brilliant. So hopefully uh, that's been useful. And yep, thank you very much. That's the end of this video.